want to talk to you about one of my grail guns. What's a grail gun? Holy grail. A gun that I've wanted for a long time and that I assumed I was going to have to pay a large sum of money to have someone make for me. Well, in this case, I was really lucky. Ruger made it for me. So we're going to be discussing Ruger's new GP100 in 44 Special. Now take a look at this. Great big holes in the cylinder. Great big hole in the barrel. We're going to talk about this, though, in several pieces. First, I want to take you through this gun, talk a little bit about why it was a grail gun for me. Then I want to talk a little bit about the 44 Special. We're going to be on the range. We're going to put a lot of rounds down through it, the evolution of that cartridge. Finally, we're going to talk about the GP100 family, which has been a rock for Ruger since 1986, something like that. It's an excellent, excellent family of guns. So I want to take you through those, but first let's take a look at this little guy. GP100 typically in 357. So after many years, Ruger just introduced it in 44 Special. So actually a few differences from a general GP100. You're going to see it has a non-fluted cylinder. I think that looks cool. Adds a little bit of weight to it, but that's all right. Three inch barrel. The total weight on this gun is about 36 ounces. It's not a super light gun. It is not, say, a Charter Arms Bulldog. But it's enough weight to make it easy to handle the 44 Special cartridge. Now, if you look at this gun, mine's a little bit different. As delivered from the factory, it comes with these Hogue mono grips. You can see right there. They're about, oh, I don't know, three quarters of an inch longer and a little bit fatter than these, which are the traditional Ruger compact grips originally made for the GP100. So as soon as I got the gun, I took these. Heck with them, I don't like them. Nothing against Hogue mono grips, it's just they're a little bit big for what this gun actually is. I did the trigger pull test on it, as is typical for a Ruger, as it comes from the box. I'm looking at 12 or 13 pounds on the double action pull. It's pretty smooth, there's a little grit in there. I can probably take that out by just taking it apart and giving it a good cleaning. Five pounds on the single action, that's not that big a deal to me because I really rarely shoot a double action revolver in single action. If I had to say take a 60 yard shot, a 100 yard shot, yes, I'm going to go to the single action. But generally when I'm putting rounds down range on a gun that is to me a great packing pistol, a great defensive pistol. I want to work it always double action. The interesting thing about the GP144 Special is that for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, there's been a cottage industry in high-end gunsmiths creating exactly this gun. They would take a GP100 in 357 Magnum, do a new cylinder, actually a new barrel, or actually go through and change out the barrel, you re-bore the barrel to 44, and it was a very time, time intensive, and because it's time intensive, a very expensive process. When you're talking about machining a new cylinder, you're talking about uh, reboring a barrel, that runs up very quickly. So these were very specialized guns, but there was a steady market and a steady demand for them. So Ruger, in the last few years, has, has done a really interesting thing from my standpoint is they've been looking at niches. I think it started with the Ruger Alaskan, which is basically what, a two and a half, two and three quarter inch Super Red Hawk that's designed to carry you know, as an Alaskan backup gun. 454 Casul, 480 Ruger, 44 Magnum, number of different varieties of that gun. But Ruger started looking at niches. Okay, where are people spending their money? Where are they spending their money with the custom gunsmiths? Where are they paying $500, $600, $1,000, $1,200 to have a Ruger converted to X. And then Ruger started filling those niches. So you've seen a whole lot of specialty guns come out of Ruger in the last couple of years. And so this one, I heard about a year and a half ago that it's coming. I got a little rumor from some friends of mine that said, hey, finally you're going to see a 44 Special in the Ruger GP100 platform. So I said, that's great, that's great. So it's taken about a year and a half to come to fruition. About six, eight months ago, I went to Texas, went to FTW Ranch, sat down with the Ruger executives, also spent some time with several of these guns. And as soon as I finished spending time with them, 
The first thing I did was order one. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. It's true, you can't avoid the struggle. It's coming, but you can control your precision. It's time to put it all on the line, because with Crimson Trace Optics, failure is not an option. The history of cartridges is very much the evolution of technology. In the black powder days, if you wanted a cartridge to have more oomph, you added more black powder to it. 4570, 45 grain bullets, 70 grains of black powder. The 44 Russian evolved in the black powder days. If you wanted more of a man stopper, you put a bigger chunk of lead inside. So the 44 Russian launched a 200, 250 grain bullet at moderate velocities by today's terms, say 700, 750 feet per second, limited by the powder. When the world went to smokeless powder, obviously cartridges changed because smokeless powder has different burn rates. You could tailor the cartridge to a specific pressure. So the 44 Russian, with its limited case capacity, grew into the 44 Special. More case capacity, much more powerful cartridge. As everything evolved, we moved up, thanks to the great Elmer Keith, to the 44 Magnum, essentially people were hot riding the 44 Special, Elmer Keith being first among them, a num number of other people as well. But they said, wow, we could take that 44 Special and push it to another level. So that became the 44 Magnum cartridge. And notice that each case is these cartridges get a little longer. That's so you can't accidentally drop a much hotter cartridge into an older gun that was not designed for that level of pressure. There now are lots of cartridges above the 44 Magnum, which we once said was the most powerful handgun on earth. But we keep coming back to the 44 Special as an ideal compromise in recoil, stopping power, size, ease of shooting, and great guns to shoot it in. Okay, these are Hornady critical defense rounds, full bore, 44 Special self-defense rounds. You can see still the difference between 44 Special, 44 Magnum. It's an easy gun to control, even with full house self-defense load. This is the exact same gun, 3-inch GP100, except in 357 Magnum. The loads that are in here are the classic 357 load, 125 grain jacketed soft point self-defense load. Okay, let's go to the big boy now so you can see that comparison. This is a 44 Magnum. It's not a three inch barrel, but it's a two and three quarter inch barrel Ruger Red Hawk. 240 grain jacket and soft point, 44 Magnum. I feel sorry for my steel target. As the great Bob Marley says, if you know your history, you know where you're coming from. And I wanted to give you a little sense of the Ruger Steel Double Action Revolver family tree. It started back in the early 70s, like 1972, when Bill Ruger decided to come out with a double action stainless steel 357, the Security 6 series. You're thinking, why? Well, most police departments at that point still issued 357 revolvers. They still rule the roost. And while Ruger never knocked Smith & Wesson from its peak as the preeminent police revolver, it made a big dent in that marketplace. Bill Ruger was always conservative. 1980, he started seeing, well, there's still back orders for that Smith & Wesson most powerful handgun in the world, the Model 29. So he decided to go in this direction, to the Ruger Red Hawk. When you look at this Red Hawk, you're going to see a lot of what defined the family of Ruger double action revolvers. The sculpting here, you'll notice that mag the cylinder release, you press in. With Smith & Wesson, you press forward. With Colt, you pull back. But this is the strongest revolver that Bill Ruger could build. The joke has always been that when there's nothing left on earth, but cockroaches and Keith Richards, not only will Ruger revolvers still work, they'll still be in time. So there were some issues with this gun. 
as it came out, as big and as beefy and as overbuilt as it is. And Ruger went back to the drawing board on it. But before he got too far along, he realized that he needed to upgrade the 357 line. And in 86, you saw the introduction of this gun. This is obviously the gun we're talking about here today, the GP100. This particular, our 44 Special, our celebrity gun of the week, if you will. So this gun came out, it followed very similar to, to Ruger's basic ideas. There is basically a spur that goes down here that allows any number of choices on grips. Once again, you see a lot of the signature Ruger framing on it. You see the signature push button. It's very much recognizable as a Ruger revolver. GP100 was pretty successful. It's a lot of varieties. In 87, Ruger rolled out their solution to the biggest, beefiest revolver on earth, the Super Red Hawk. Now, if you look, you can see the difference with the Super Red Hawk and its hugely beefed up frame. Like this is still part of the overall frame of the gun. This is, by the way, a Ruger Alaskan, which turned out to be a spectacular hit for Ruger. Uh, this particular version in 454 Casul, also 480 Ruger, their own proprietary big bore cartridges. This gun, the Super Red Hawk, in many ways defined big bore double action revolvers. Following a couple of years later, Ruger made a check and said, hey, a lot of people are buying little guns. They're not buying little guns from us. Now, part of that was that sort of mindset of Ruger that, hey, if you want a little gun, get a three-inch GP100. That'll do you, which, which it will in most cases. But Ruger finally realized we need to come out with essentially what they think is a pocket pistol. Well, they did. This is the SP-101. And it's easy to see, once again, the familial res resemblance to all other Rugers. It's a great little gun. It's also 25 ounces. It is a beefy gun for pocket carry. However, I've shot pretty much every one of the small frame, J frame, whatever you want to call the smallest frame revolvers. This is unconditionally the only one that I would shoot on a regular basis in 357 Magnum. And that's because of the weight, because of the heft. Key thing is Ruger constantly keeps redefining the line with different versions, different calibers, different barrel lengths, sometimes different grips. And that's one of the things that has made the GP100 line so successful. Hey, you got 327, a Ruger proprietary cartridge that they designed. You got 357. If you need, you have 38 plus P. You also have 22 long rifle. I'm a big fan of that one because it's great to practice with. So you're not out there pounding yourself to death with really heavy loads. And now you have the 44 Special, which again, I think, is the pick of the litter. This week's trigger is brought to you by Midway USA. Just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. Taurus USA, designed to protect. Rock Island Arms Corps, solid as a rock. Bocortson, engineering the world's finest rimfire rifles, pistols, and parts. And Franklin Armour, making some of the most innovative guns in America. I've already seen a little of Ruger's steel family. I want to take a look now at the GP100 family, which is really very, very large. I was never a fan of the GP100. I was a Smith & Wesson guy. I had Colts. I had Smith & Wessons. I did not have Ruger revolvers. However, however, my friend Ken Jorgensen, working at Ruger, called me up one day and said, I'm going to send you a GP100. It's our new gun. It's called the Match Champion. And I said, eh, whatever. And he goes, no, no. He goes, shoot it. Shoot it and see what you think of it. Ken himself, a veteran revolver shooter, revolver competitor, shooting in i various revolver championships, because this is a great gun. And it is a great gun. It's in 357. It's called a match champion because it was designed around IDPA revolver competition, designed to fit that criteria. These particular grips, Hogue wooden grips, really excellent competition type grips. Obviously, not something for concealment. 
Once again, you see, as we did in the Wiley Clap versions of these guns, dovetailed, fixed sights, fiber optic front sight. Now, not only do you think of this as a competition gun, this is a great baseline 38 357. If you're, say, a prepper and you want to have one revolver that you know you could pass down to your great, 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 great grandchildren, this would be the one to have. Over the years, the Ruger GP100 line has gotten very wide and very deep. Multiple different barrel lengths, three, four, five, six specials from distributors like Lipsy's and Talo. In terms of caliber, always 38, 357, the baseline. 327, that was a caliber developed by Ruger and Hornady that should have been a big success and wasn't, and it's probably the subject of its own show. 22 long rifle and now 44 special. I talked about how my first GP100 was that match champion. I decided I wanted to shoot the i World Revolver Championships and film it for shooting gallery and use a GP100. This is a gun that I bought off one of the auction sites. It's probably 10, 12 years old. Longer barrel. I sent it to Cylinder and Slideshow. If you might be able to see their logo right here on the top strap in Fremont, Nebraska, and had them work it out into a pure competition gun. Obviously, they've taken off the hammer spur. It has a super slick action. Considering you're going to be shooting all your rounds double action, you need that. The grips are from Hogue. They're called Big Butt Grips. Yes, that's something you probably heard in a Queen song. But they're designed for this type specific revolver competition. From here, I had the opportunity to purchase a Wiley Clap 3 inch 357. Wiley, good friend of mine, I saw him at the shot show. Wiley said, Michael, it's not going to kill you to buy one of my guns. And I mean buy, not con somebody out of one. So I bought this gun. It went to Jiminy Custom. It's a 357 gun. Jiminy Custom has been doing Ruger GP100s for a long time. And they basically tuned this gun up, smoothed out all the rough edges. It's designed as a good utility gun. It has an excellent trigger pull. One of the things I like about it too are these fixed sights. If you've got a gun that's a utility gun, if you're a prepper, if you've got property that you're carting the gun around on, if you're going to knock the gun around, and believe me, my guns get knocked around, what you like is fixed sights because it's harder to knock them off. Yes, you're going to have to work a little figuring out which load hits where, but that's not that big a deal. It's so a much bigger deal to knock those adjustable sights loose. In my own collection, this is a GP100 10-shot 22 long rifle. Why would I want this? Well, when I'm shooting competition revolver, when I'm planning on going to an i match or an i World Championship, I need to tune up. I need to put a lot of rounds downrange. These days, now that 22 is back available in the market, it is a lot less expensive to run a 22 caliber revolver than it is to run 38 match ammunition through it. So what I do is I put in probably 10 to 1, 10 times the practice with this gun, to one time the amount of ammunition that I'm putting through my competition pistol. So as you can see, GP100 pretty much run the gamut easy to see why the 44 Special, to me, is an ideal addition to this line. I would fully expect to see some 5-inch, 6-inch barreled 44 Specials coming down the line from Ruger, but hey, I got no secret information. You probably get the impression from this report that I like this revolver. Well, I do. I like it a lot. Always like 44 Special. As I said, I have a pretty substantial collection of double action 44 specials, and I would put this guy at the absolute top of the heap. This is a gun that's going to become my packing pistol. Got a little work on it left to do. I'd kind of like to go maybe to a brass bead, gold bead front sight. Go to a Hamilton Bowen rough country rear sight. Not that much, a little work on the action, and this guy's going to be riding with me whenever I'm out here on the secret hidden bunker ranch. So. If you're looking for a big bore pistol, and you're looking for a big bore pistol that you can hand down to all your descendants, Ruger GP100 44 Special, the way to go.